We are now going to look at the third part in the research methods section, and this is titled Analyzing Research. I've had to split this up into two parts. So the first part is going to be looking at the math skills involved, and the second part will be looking at uh, reliability, validity, and bias. So here we go. As I said, topics included types of data, descriptive statistics, distribution, tables, charts, and graphs, and those two will be in later video. So starting off with types of data then, we can categorize data into quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative is numerical data. It's got the N in the word quantitative, which is what numerical starts with. So for the example that we've been looking at throughout the research methods topics, um, we could have the students in the noisy uh, condition scored 40 points lower than those in the silent condition. That is an example of quantitative data because it is a number, 40. A benefit of quantitative data is that it's easy to find trends and analyze. However, it is reductionist. This means it attempts to simplify human behavior down uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily represent the whole aspect of the behavior. So much too simple. The other type of data is qualitative. This is word data. For example, we could write down um, the, the body language students might show. Uh, for example, they might have their head in their hands, which means they might be quite stressed. They might have their arms folded. So we could record the name or we could label the body language they're showing, and that would be qualitative data. An advantage of this is that it provides rich data. So there's lots of in-depth knowledge there, uh, and it tends to have lots of insight. Um, however, it is quite hard to analyze and very subjective. What this means is it's open to interpretation and personal opinion. So if I were to analyse the qualitative data of that study, I might get very different conclusions compared to another psychologist. We can also categorise data into primary and secondary data. Primary data is data the researcher has gathered themselves. For example, the researcher collecting those maths test scores. The benefit of this is that we know that we can trust the data. We've standardized the maths test. We might know it's a, a valid maths test. And so we can trust this data. The other type, secondary data, is data that's collected by someone else who is independent of the research study. They're not involved at all. For example, we could use data from exam boards, for example, AQA or OCR, and we could collect all the GCSE grades from that exam board. The benefit of this is it saves us lots of time and lots of money, and it also gives us access to data that we might not be able to collect ourselves. So if I'm collecting all of the student scores for um, this maths test, I wouldn't have access to everyone in the whole countries. However, by going to the exam board, they would because they have to uh, collect them in to mark them. So it gives us access to this data that we might not be able to get ourselves. Moving on to descriptive statistics, what actually are they? These are used to organize or summarize sets of data. It's no point picking out individual data points uh, and looking at that. Instead, you want you often want a number that represents that entire data set to allow faster or quick analysis. So there are lots of different types of, of descriptive data, uh, statistics even. Um, that includes measures of central tendency, the range, percentages and standard deviation. For your GCSE, you need to know those first three. So let's start with measures of central tendency. A measure of central tendency gives the researcher a score that represents the data set it has come from. And there are three different ways to calculate measures of central tendency. Hopefully you are familiar with them. Number one is the mode. This is the most commonly occurring score. This is the only measure of central tendency that um, could have one value, two values, or no values. You can remember mode because mode starts with MO and so does most. So it's the most common, most frequent value. The second type is the median. So to find the median of a data set, you're going to put all of the data in numerical order and you're going to look to see which data point is in the middle. And that will give you your median score. If there are two um, data points in the middle, so two different numbers, you would instead work out the mean of those two. The mean, you add up all the scores of the data set together and you divide by the total number of data points. So here's an example data set. Let's imagine these are the maths test scores out of 20. The mode here would be 12 because there are two data points um, that have a score of 12. It's the only point that occurs twice, therefore that is our most commonly occurring number. The median, we've um, listed them all in numerical order, so from the lowest to the biggest, 4 to 15. The one that's in the, num uh, in the middle is 10. It's got four numbers either side of it, so it's exactly in the middle. To do the mean, we're going to add up all of the scores. We get a total sum of 85. 
You're then going to divide that 85 by how many numbers there are. There are nine, and that would give us a mean of 9.4. Another example of descriptive statistics are the range. So to work out the range, you subtract the lowest data score in a data set from the highest. So again, there's our data. 15 was the highest, 4 was the lowest. 15 minus 4 gives you 9. So the range will be 9. Percentages, ratios, and fractions. These are all types of descriptive statistics. Again, percentages, they represent an amount out of 100. Ratios so show the relative size of two or more values, and fractions show the proportion of a value. Let's have a look at some examples. So out of a sample of 150 people, 100 of them had blue eyes. The rest all had brown eyes. Show this as a percentage and as a ratio and fraction in its simplest form. Starting off with a percentage, the way you work them out is you would do 100, because that's the number of people with blue eyes, divided by the total sample, which is 150, then times that by 100, and you would get 66.67%. To work out the ratio, um, you need to make sure you get it in the right order, so right blue to brown, because that's what we're looking at. 100 of the sample had blue eyes, tells us that in the question. There was a total number of 150 people, so that means that only 50 people had brown eyes. We did 150 minus 100 of them which had the blue eyes. So that gives us a ratio of 100 to 50. We can simplify that down further of 2 to 1. So for every one person with brown eyes, there are two people with blue eyes. Finally, as a fraction then, so we've got 100 out of 150 participants. Uh, if we simplify it down, we've got two thirds. Just a couple of things to note. Um, with percentages, if your answer gives you more than 100% of a sample, it's likely you've done the calculation wrong. You might have swapped the numbers around the wrong way, so you're on 150 divided by 100. Um, just a note, though, if you're looking at percentage change, then this can be greater than 100%. With ratios, notice how the whole ratio, before it's simplified, adds up to the total sample size. So here we're looking at 150. It's really easy to um, slip into the habit of writing 100 to 150. But that would be wrong. That would mean we had a sample of one hundred of two hundred fifty people in total. We did not, so it's a a ratio, sorry, of one hundred to fifty. Moving on to decimals. So decimal place refers to the number of figures after a decimal point, and we often tend to round to two decimal places. In some questions, it might specify how many decimal places you need to round to. If not, two is a good rule of thumb. If the third decimal place is five or higher, then we round the second decimal place up by one. If the third decimal place is less than five, then we can round it down. So we've got two examples here, 9.873445899. We're not going to record that whole number. Instead, we're going to round it to two decimal places. So I'm going to look for that third number. Here it is, three. So because the third digit after the decimal point is below five, we know we need to round it down. So I'm going to round that down to 9.87. Our second example, we've got 3.1768314. Again, you're not going to write down the whole number. You're instead going to round it to decimal, two, two decimal places. I'm going to look for that third decimal place, uh, which is six. Because it is five or more, I'm going to round that second figure up. So that will give me 3.18. Um, we can also represent numbers in standard form. So standard form is always used to express very large or very small numbers. And it always takes on the format of A times 10 to the power of N. A stands for any number that is one or more, but is less than 10. So from one all the way up to 9.999999 recurring. The N represents a power of 10. If this is a positive number, then we know that it represents a very large number. If it is a negative number, then we know it represents a very small number. Let's look at it with some examples. So on the left, I've got 5.32 times 10 to the power of 4. Let's look at how we would work out what that number is in not standard form. So the way that I find easiest to do this is to um, write down a load of zeros next to it. Now, I know because it's a positive power um, of 10, so it's 10 to the power of 4 rather than a negative number, I know that this must be a large number. So I'm going to put the zeros after the um, decimal point. So I've not moved the decimal point yet. I've just stuck it in where it is already. I'm then going to move it four places to the right because it's 10 to the power of four. So here we go. One, two, three, four. And that there is where my decimal point needs to stay. 
53,200. Now you can write 0.00 or you can just write 53,200 because it's the same thing. The example on the right then, 9.98 times 10 to the minus three. Because it's a negative number, I know this must be a small number. So instead of putting the zeros after the decimal point this time, I've now put them in front of the number. So I'm going to put the decimal point in where it already was, which is 9.98, and I'm going to move it three places to the left. So one, two, three. And that leaves me with 0 0.00998. And that is those two numbers written not in standard form. Now, you also have to be able to do it the other way around, so be able to take numbers and put them in standard form. So here's an example, uh, we've got 458,900. Now, the first step is to find a number that is one or more but less than 10. So in this example, it will be 4.589. So I've moved the decimal point uh, to 4 to after the 4. So I know it's going to be 4.589 times 10 to the something. Now to work out um, the power of 10 that it, we've times it by, we need to work out how many spaces we've moved the decimal point. So the decimal point would have started off at the end of the number there. So I'm, now I'm just going to count the number of places. So one, two, three, four, five. I've moved it five places to the left. So it's going to be 4.589 times 10 to the power of 5. It's a positive uh, power of 10 because it is a big number. Our other example is 0 0.0031. Again, I'm going to look for a number that is 1 or more but less than 10. So in this example, it's going to be 3.1. That's more than that's 1 or more but less than 10. So I know it's going to be 3.1 times 10 to the something. To work out the 10 to the something, I'm going to count how many places I've moved that decimal point to the right. So one, two, three, four. Because I've moved it to the right, it must be a negative number. So it's going to be 3.1 times 10 to the minus four. And that's how you convert um, a normal number into its standard form. Moving on to look at distribution then. So distribution refers to the shape a variable makes when it's plotted on a graph. Most variables are normally distributed. They have a shape like this. We also refer to this as a bell-shaped curve. Uh, there's often a line down the middle, and that line represents the mean, median, and modal value of that data set. But we can also have two other types of distribution. Here we've got an example of a negatively skewed distribution. This is where most of the data points are concentrated on the right-hand side of the x-axis. The opposite of negatively skewed is positively skewed. And this is where most of the data points are concentrated to the left-hand side of the x-axis. So those are the three types of distribution that variables can take when plotted on a graph. Leading on to graphs then, how do we know how to pick the correct type of graph? Different data can be represented by different graphs, um, some of which are more appropriate than others. So you need to know how or which type of graph to display your data in. The first type then, we've got frequency tables. So these are useful for recording raw data from observations, typically used for categoric um, variables. So um, variables that you cannot assign numbers to. So here is behavior, putting hand up, making notes. They are categories, not a number. Bar charts, I'd also put up pie charts as well with these. So these are both used when one variable is categorical. So that means it's groups, not numbers, again. So the bar chart, we've got eye color. You can't assign a number to blue, brown, and green. They are just colors. Um, and then you've got the number of people up the y-axis. You can also represent this data in a pie chart. You just make sure you need to make sure that um, your pie chart adds up to 100% and that you label each segment with what it represents. Moving on, we've got the line graphs. So here we are plotting score on math test against IQ. Uh, these line graphs, they are used to represent continuous data. So continuous is um, data that takes on a numerical form, so it's numbers, and those numbers can have any value. So uh, one, two, all the way up to infinity, and they can be decimals as well. Um, now, these are different from scattergrams, which are used to represent correlations. So just a note there. Histograms. Now, you might be familiar with these from maths. Um, they do look like bar charts, but they are different. And this is because they are used to represent continuous data. Typically, when one of the variables is grouped in unequal intervals. 
So the area of the bar represents frequency. And you, the way you calculate how high to do your bar is um, it's called the frequency density. And you calculate it by dividing the frequency, so how often that uh, age or whatever the group is occurs, divided by the class width. So how wide that interval is of each group of data. So that is a histogram. It is used for continuous data. Do not confuse it with a bar chart. And that is all for um, part one of this video based on maths. Uh, maths, the part two will look at validity, reliability, and sources of bias.